Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Give us one hour and we'll help you change the way you think about happiness. Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. Each week, Lisa spotlights diverse trendsetters and change agents who are the greatest contemporary thinkers and doers, devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. Your host, Lisa Cypress Kamen, is a widely recognized applied positive psychology expert, author, documentary filmmaker, and lecturer specializing in optimal lifestyle management. Let's get to it. Here's Lisa. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining me on today's show, where you will learn about the power of productivity. My first guest is Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett, and this conversation was originally aired in November of 2020. Dr. Feldman Barrett has received numerous scientific awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship in Neuroscience and an NIH Director's Pioneer Award. She is a university distinguished professor at Northeastern University with appointments at Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital. Her most recent book is Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain. She is also the author of the best-selling book, How Emotions Are Made. Lisa, thanks for joining us on the show. I'm really excited to talk with you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Well, we love to know what's under our human hood here. <laughs> We're curious minds. Talk a little bit about how brains have evolved in humans. Well, that three pound blob of meat between your ears looks like it's pretty ordinary, but it's actually one of the most complex organs that the complex things that that evolution has ever produced. And the really interesting thing to me was that, you know, if you go back Several hundred million years ago, the Earth was ruled by creatures that didn't have brains. I mean, I, I, I'm resisting the urge to make a comment about the current political situation <laughs> and how it could feel like the Earth is still ruled by creatures without brains. But, you know, 550 million years ago, you know, creatures really didn't have brains and they didn't need brains um, because they were, the organisms were pretty simple. And the Scientists guess now, their best guess is that brains evolved under the selection pressure of hunting. That when animals actually started to deliberately hunt each other, and where the most important question in existence became, is that blob up ahead good to eat? Or is it going to eat me? Uh, this introduced a whole set, a whole cascade of problems that uh, that creatures had to solve. And one thing led to another, as I discuss in the book, and, and um, brains evolved. And the really interesting thing to me, anyways, is that, um, you know, if you ask most people, like, what's your brain's most important job? Most people will tell you, well, it's to think, it's to be rational, it's to be reasonable. That's, that's the most important thing that our brain does. And it's the most evolved thing that our brain does. But in fact, your brain's most important job is to regulate the systems of your body. As mm. animals got bigger and bodies got bigger, they needed brains um, to control all those systems in, in your body. So right now, as we're talking to one another and as your listeners are listening, each one of us has a, a drama going on inside our own bodies that we're largely unaware of for the most part. And your brain's job is to be the conductor, uh, you know, the orchestra conductor of that, draw, of that, of that symphony or of that drama. Well, I, I want to ask you a question about that, because the more we uh, the more stress we have, the more overloaded our brains become, either with information or with stress, it's really hard for us to orchestrate what is going on. Right. Well, yes and no. It certainly feels that way. But I guess what I would say it, to answer your question is to back up and say, what does it mean to say that a brain regulates your body. And 
you know, your brain didn't evolve to think or feel or see, it evolved to regulate your body and you think and feel and see in the service of regulating your body. That's not how it seems to us, but that's actually what's happening under the hood. And so what is stress from this perspective? Stress is where your brain is predicting, uh, it's making a guess that in the next moment, your body's going to need a major metabolic out, outlay, either because you're going to move in some significant way, or you're going to learn something new, which are the two things that are very expensive for your brain to do, learning something new and moving in some significant way. And what you're going to do is essentially use up a bunch of resources. And so the way that I describe this, it has a very technical name called allostasis, but the way I describe it is just think about your brain as budgeting for your body. Your brain is running a body budget and it's not budgeting money. It's budgeting salt and glucose and water and oxygen and all of the nutrients that you need to stay alive and well. And so what your brain is doing is constantly managing the deposits and the withdrawals. So when you go exercise, you go for a hike or you go for a run, you're making a withdrawal. When you eat or sleep or get a hug from a friend, you're making a deposit. Now, what's stress? Stress is where your brain is preparing for a major withdrawal. Mm. That's not necessarily bad. When you wake up in the morning, your brain is preparing for a major withdrawal because you're about to get out of bed. When you, right before you're, you're ready to exercise, go for a run or, or work out at the gym, your brain is preparing for a major withdrawal. The issue is um, that, you know, you have to replenish. You have to, after you make a withdrawal, you need to make a deposit. You, um, and sometimes we make withdrawals, uh, you know, as a way of making an investment in the future, right? And that's what exercise is, for example, or learning something new. The problem comes when your brain prepares you for a major withdrawal and that withdrawal never comes. So, for example, cortisol, which a lot of people think of as a stress hormone, is really not a stress hormone. Its job is to get glucose into your bloodstream really fast because your brain is expecting that you're going to need it. And if you don't need it, you feel that as stress, essentially. Or when you make many, many deposits, uh, many, many withdrawals, uh, and then you don't replenish with deposits, like say you don't get enough sleep or you don't eat healthfully or, you know, so if you have too many withdrawals or, you know, um, that you don't replenish uh, with deposits or if you keep preparing for withdrawals that never come, each of those times, you know, you're sort of paying a little metabolic tax and that adds up over time you know, it's a slow drift, but it adds up over time, sort of like boring a hole, you know, through a, a pipe with, with a drip of water. And eventually you feel really crappy. And um, if that goes on for too long, you can actually get sick. I want to ask you about the deposits. So you mentioned about like having sleep, good nutrition, exercise is another one. I think we as humans often overlook nourishing our brains. We think, okay, um, the brain is somehow a separate system from the other parts of ourselves. But there are th sound things that we can do to maintain brain health and optimal brain performance. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, brain health is, is crucial really to, to overall health. I mean, I think that um, it's not just your memory that you have to worry about when your brain starts to fail you. Um, you as brains age, um, their ability to regulate our bodies also um, diminishes. And that, you know, sets us up for a set of uh, making us more vulnerable to a set of illnesses. So brain health is, is crucially important. It's, as you say, it's, it's usually overlooked, but it's actually um, one of the most important things that you can do for yourself. And the earlier in your life you realize that, uh, the better off you'll be in the long run. What are some things that we can do on a daily basis besides those basic self-care tips that, that we've just spoken of that would contribute towards healthy brain functioning? Yeah, so um, I'm happy to talk about additional ones, but I do want to point out that sleep, getting enough yeah. sleep <laughs> is actually 
you know, the science is telling us that that's a crucial, crucial, crucial piece of this equation. So if, if you only had the opportunity to do one thing that you would change, it would be to get enough sleep. And, you know, a lot of the things that we can do are obvious in, in the sense that um, we can, you know, keep well hydrated and, you know, eat healthily and exercise on a regular basis. These are all really important things for, for brain health. They're, they're things that not everybody has the luxury to do, unfortunately. Not everybody has control over their lives to that extent, but everybody has control over something. And so, you know, these are some things that you can do. You can also... There are some other things that you can do too. So for example, your brain is a kind of a use it or lose it organ. And so that's why exercise is so beneficial to brain health, to your memory, um, to your brain's ability to control your body easily with very little tax that you will pay, metabolically speaking. Um, and so for example, continuing to in a sense, continuing to stress yourself, but in a good in a good way and in a controlled way. So, for example, learning a new skill like um, learning to paint, or learning um, to play tennis, or learning to speak a different language, or learning um, to uh, be a potter, or something like that. You know, these the kinds of skills that require um, significant investments over a longer term where it can actually be hard, hard enough that like exercise, you might feel a little crappy in the moment because you're making a major metabolic outlay. And as long as you replenish that major metabolic outlay, your brain will be actually much more, will be healthier and much more flexible. And that's really what you want. So anything that makes you in the moment feel a little yucky, <laughs> as long as you, as long as you replenish what you've spent that's something that can be, you know, really important for brain health. Another thing that's important for brain health, surprisingly, is um, actually being socially connected to people. So we did not um, evolve as a species to be alone. Um, we don't manage our body budgets on our own. We make, you know, figuratively speaking, um, deposits and withdrawals into each other's um, body budget. So we are, to some extent, we are the caretakers of each other's nervous systems as much as we are the caretakers of our own. And so um, being around people who you have supportive relationships with turns out to be extremely good for your health, both your physical health and that translates to your brain health. Well, and we know it works for mental health. We know it works for physical health. So it, it sort of, you know, makes sense that you're saying that for our brain health as well, we're going to need to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to continue the conversation with Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett to learn more about her and her work and her newest book, Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain. Please visit lisafeldmanbarrett.com and on Twitter at L Feldman Barrett. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back. And that is a promise. Hang on just a little minute. Before we take that break, let's talk about the importance of making time to play. Even for us grown-ups. we work hard and yet we don't always give ourselves permission to have fun. And everyone deserves a little downtime. When I've got a few minutes to spare, I love to amuse myself with Best Fiends, an exciting puzzle adventure game where you can have some silly good times anytime and anywhere. Best Fiends is my go-to digital play pal, and I am happily hooked. And if you're anything like me, you will be too. Not to brag or anything, but I'm kicking some serious butt and about to hit level 7,593. I feel like such an accomplished champ. The fun never ends at Best Fiends because there's always fresh content and pop-up challenges to conquer. I pinky swear you'll never be bored or run out of goals to achieve. You'll never be stranded without fun at your fingertips, and you can even play offline. Don't blame me if you end up kind of obsessed. Need a little digital distraction or a virtual time out? Stress less and play more and add a little more joy to your daily routine. You've earned your fun time. Go to the App Store or Google Play to download Best Fiends for free. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Now let's take that pause. We'll be right back. 
To learn more about cultivating sustainable well-being at home and the office, visit HarvestingHappiness.com and explore Lisa's experiential on-site brain fitness workshops, corporate programming, and speaking engagement services. And we're back continuing the conversation about the power of productivity with my guest, Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett. And this conversation was originally recorded in November of 2020. I want to just uh, shift the conversation a little bit to talk about the title of your book, Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain. How did you come up with the title? Well, a number of years ago, I had an idea to write a book very much like this. I was going to call it Six Facts About the Brain, based on, it was a riff off of a book that I had read called um, The Six Drinks That Changed the World, which is actually a fantastic book. It's a book about coffee and tea and liquor and wine and how these drinks, you know, each at certain eras in history played a role in um, charting actually uh, human, the, the history and direction of human civilization. So I thought, okay, I'll, and then but then um, as I was working on the, the outline of the book, I was very fortunate to receive uh, an NIH Director's Pioneer Award, um, which, you know, basically required me to drop everything that I was doing and, um, and attend to my lab full, like 100% of the time. Um, and so fast forward a decade, and um, I was having lunch with um, the acquisition editor who purchased how Emotions Are Made, The Secret Life of the Brain. She had acquired the manuscript for Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, my, at my publishing house. And um, she, she had left at that point. And she was telling me about a book um, that was recent, that she was editing for uh, Carlos Rivelli, the physicist, uh, called uh, Seven Brief Lessons in physics. And I said, Oh, that's so interesting that you tell me that because I, you know, and I started to tell her about this book that I had had this idea to write, uh, you know, basically a decade ago, um, and uh, a, a little book of essays. And um, I, I just never really got back to it. And she said, Well, I, I think that would be a fantastic book. And I was telling her all about, you know, what the various lessons that I would, you know, um, would include. And she said, Oh, that's, that's a really great idea. So I happened to be in New York when, you know, and I was meeting with her um, for a meal. And so I just walked across the street to my agent's <laughs> office and said, Hey, what do you think about this? And he was like, I love that idea. Um, and as I was working on the book, I realized that I really, you know, the first lesson is, is a lesson about um, brain evolution, but it, it, it's a lesson that's really focused on um, explaining that you don't really have a lizard brain, you know, this idea that you have a, an inner reptile, you know, lizard brain that is um, responsible for your urges and, um, and uh, that, you know, your neocortex basically controls this lizard brain. So the idea is that your big, your big, uh, beautiful uh, cerebral cortex, the, the home of your rationality, you know, controls your inner beast, essentially. This is the whole thing is basically a myth, although it's a very, very popular myth. And uh, I decided, though, that it would be really, really interesting to actually tell a little bit, give a little bit more history about the evolution of the brain. Cause I was really, really struck by this question of like, why do we even have brains in the first place? Like, what is a brain good for? Why did it evolve in the first place? And so that became the half lesson. Um, so there's a, the half lesson is a little story, a partial story really about the, um, the dawn of brains on earth. And that leads into, uh, the rest of the lessons, um, in the book. And each essay is, you know, each it's like a tasting menu, essentially, of um, topics where, you know, you get a little bit of neuroscience that's very, very, very digested um, for it's really written. The essays are written for people who don't normally think of themselves as being interested in popular science. And it introduces some um, some really cool little tidbits um, that you can, you know, entertain your friends with or your family um, and then, it also, <laughs> okay. <laughs> also, it, it really, you know, it, it, it works. I, I will say, um, uh, 
you know, part of the inspiration was, you know, dinner party after dinner party, my, we would come home and my husband would say, you know, you had the, you had the people at the table in the palm of your hands when you were talking about, you know, this part of the brain, (laughs) who can do that? But the interesting thing I think is that each essay really invites you to take this little nugget about the brain and to think about what it means for human nature. You know, think about what it means for the kind of human that you are or that you want to be. Yeah. I like that about, you know, really taking the perspective that our brains help us become who we are or who we're not. And your little snippy comment at the beginning of our conversation about the the politicians, I mean, made me laugh because it's like, you know, you do think, you know, are are, are we becoming a mindless society? And I don't think that's the case. I mean, we know so much more about the brain than we did even 20 years ago. Yeah. And in fact, I think one of the really coolest things, and this is something that I, uh, about brains, and it is something that I talk about in one of the lessons is that, you know, we have this kind of basic brain plan that we share with each other, all humans, and actually all mammals have the same brain plan and maybe even all vertebrates, that is all animals with backbones. So we have this basic brain plan for humans. But we have very, very, very different kinds of minds that evolve out of this brain plan. And so how does that work? Like, how is it? There is no real human nature. There are human natures. There are many, many, many different kinds of human minds. And how do you get all of these different kinds of human minds out of a single basic um, plan? You know, um, that's a really, really interesting question. And it also invites us to think about variation in and in humans. And I think, you know, to me, one of the things that strikes me the most is that humans love variation in food, in clothes, in weather, in cars, but not so much in each other. You know, we have a really hard time with people who are really different from us. And Of course, I'm speaking really generally here, you know, you're, you know, there are probably individual listeners who are thinking, not me, I have no problem with people who are different than me. I'm making a sweeping generalization, but I think it's a generalization that holds pretty well. Yeah. Is that because it makes us feel safe? Like when we feel like we can recognize something of ourselves in the other, and there is a sense of familiarity, right? That there isn't too much of a difference that we feel like we feel okay, we feel safe, we feel like we're in a predictable environment. Is that where it comes from? Exactly. I mean, you just hit the nail on the head, which is we're in a predictable environment. Yeah. 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 And it turns out, you know, what does that mean under the hood, a predictable environment? And what it means, again, it comes back to body budgeting. What are the things that are really, really expensive for a brain to do? Move your body, and learn something new. So if you're with people who are unlike you and are fundamentally unpredictable to you, that is a costly thing to do, if, to interact with them. Now, sometimes we crave novelty. We seek it out. We travel to places that we've never been before. We, it's sort of like planning to exercise. You know it's something you're going to do. You're looking forward to that sort of increase in arousal that comes with you know excitement, learning something new. Um, and as long as you replenish, you're okay. But when you're dealing with uncertainty, especially coming from other humans, it's really, really hard on you. And it's hard on your nervous system. It's just, it's not because we're snowflakes or because we're lazy. It's just how we're (laughs) built. We're humans. We have a human nervous system and that's how human nervous systems work. So it's really challenging, actually. It's really rewarding but it, it, it's also really challenging. It's, 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 it's expensive, metabolically speaking. And, you know, people now don't, you know, people are struggling with their body budgets. I would say if I had to engineer a cultural context that would bankrupt a body budget or at least push it to the brink of bankruptcy, it wouldn't look very different from the one that we currently are living in. I was thinking as you were speaking, I was thinking the same thing. It's like it does put us into a bit of a a crisis or the potential for crisis. Um, We're almost out of time. And I want to ask you something about 
and I don't even know if the terminology that I'm about to share is correct or makes sense, but there are some amazing individuals in history and who are alive today who are like right left brain synthesizers, right? They're able to really activate both sides of their brain or they have in, in history. And I'm thinking of Leonardo da Vinci as one example, you know, that he had the science down and the art down. And what is it about characters like him that are so special? You know, I don't know that he is that special. And, and here's why. I think that, first of all, we all use both sides of our brain all the time. That it's the idea that people are more left-brained or more right-brained is not really held up well under uh, scientific scrutiny. We all use all of our brain all of the time. It doesn't may not feel that way. <laughs> so we're <laughs> myth-busting. We should probably interject yeah. that. We are myth-busting. <laughs> yeah. But I will say that, that one thing that makes Leonardo unique or people like him unique is that he foraged for information. He was an explorer. Now, when we say he was an explorer, I don't necessarily mean he explored, you know, outer space or that he explored, you know, um, unseen parts of the world. He was exploring um, knowledge and topics that um, that normally people don't explore at the same time. So, um, you know, people typically, because of the way societies are organized, you know, if you're kind of mathy, then you go in a math direction. If you're kind of artsy, you go in an arts direction. To some extent, we're constantly curating our own environments or environments are curated for us that limit what we learn. They limit what we're exposed to. And, um, you know, we're everything that we experience becomes fodder for our brains to use in the future to, to construct those experiences. So I guess what I would say about Leonardo and, and, other people who are notable in history in that way is that they foraged for information really outside the tr typical boundaries that that society set for them. So he was someone who he was interested in science, but he was also interested in art and he was also interested in philosophy and he was interested in engineering. And so he was really, you know, he treated the boundaries between disciplines with the disdain that those boundaries deserve is what I would say. Um, and he didn't allow himself to be constrained by the expectations that he would forage only for knowledge in only one domain. And I think that the reason why I say I don't think he's unusual, or I think he's not special is I think if we, he's special in the sense that he cultivated for himself those opportunities. But I think that if we, if we constructed our cultural, you know, landscape in a way that allowed people to forage from different um, domains to learn and make connections between things that we think of as somewhat different, people would do it. So, you know, my husband is a musician, but he's also a computer scientist. And actually, there's a whole legion of engineers who are actually also musicians. And there are, you know, I have people who in my lab who um, are really, really interested in human sciences, like public health, but they're also really interested in neuroscience. Um, and, uh, you know, in my book, for example, um, actually in both books, uh, there's something there for philosophers. There's something there for, for people who are interested in big questions about human nature, philosophy, or for history, or neuroscience, or psychology. So I think that more of us could be more like uh, da Vinci in the sense that, you know, we could broaden our horizons and, and really benefit from, from doing so. Wow. Will you come back again? Because I feel like we've only like scratched the surface of this conversation. I, I had written down some other questions, but we don't have time. So if you'll come back again, we could take a deeper dive. <laughs> I'd be delighted. It would, it's such a pleasure to, to talk with you. Oh, I'm, it's a pleasure to have you. The book we're speaking of today is Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain. My guest has been Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett. To learn more about Dr. Feldman Barrett and her work, please visit lisafeldmanbarrett.com and on Twitter at L. Feldman Barrett. Once again, the book, I'm going to give it a shout out because you can educate yourself for some fabulous dinner conversation. Seven and a half lessons about the brain. 
Lisa, thanks for joining me. And I look forward to you coming back again. I think it will be fantastic. I'm looking forward to it too. We'll take that quick break and we'll be right back. Did you know that happiness is actually good for your health? Happy people live longer, are more productive, and make better partners, parents, and professionals. Connect with us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and follow Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen for a daily dose of inspiration. back continuing the conversation about the power of productivity. My next guest is Chris Bailey, and this conversation was originally aired in January of 2019. My first guest is Chris Bailey. He is the author of The Productivity Project, and he's in the house, and we're talking about his newest book, Hyper Focus, How to Be More Productive in a World of Distraction. Oh, Chris Bailey in the house. How are you? In the house. I in the house. In the house. I am awesome. I'm awesome because I get to be with you talking about a subject that I am happily crazy about, which yeah. is productivity. You've got this amazing new book with lots of tips and strategies. Talk about why. Why you wrote yeah. this book. <laughs> Yeah. So, so when the first book came out, the, the Productivity Project, I noticed a sort of uncomfortable truth with, with the way that I was working. And mind you, it was a book about productivity. It was sharing some lessons on how to become more productive. But I realized that when it came out, I, I, I was more distracted at that point than I had been in years, even though I've been telling people that we should resist distractions because they compromise our attention. They lead us to become less happy. They make us less productive. Uh, and so I realized like, okay, maybe there's a couple things going on here. Maybe if I'm facing this as somebody who's such a, a big nerd about productivity, other people are too, but maybe there's also a bigger picture that I was missing with regard to how we can focus better every day. Cause uh, frankly, you know, most of us were looking down uh, at our phones these days. We're not looking out into the world We're we're connecting with people less. We remember less. We're, we're seeing less meaning in, in, in what's around us. And so maybe there's a, a better answer out there. Well, I think that you hit the nail on the head. These digital devices, while they are life altering, they are doing something to our brains yes. that might not be so great. Oh, yeah. It, there, there's one study that I love that that's actually kind of uh, illuminating. They, they had one group of people, they measured their, their uh, chances at getting PTSD. And one group of people watched six or more hours of news coverage about the Boston Marathon bombings. And, and they found that those people were more likely to get PTSD than somebody who was at the bombing and personally affected by it. And, you know, after encountering a few ideas like this, I started to realize like, okay, this is bigger than just our productivity. Like productivity is kind of a, a, a side effect of managing our attention well. But really the bigger idea here is that the state of our attention determines the state of our lives. And so if we're distracted in each moment and that leads us to feel overwhelmed, these moments don't exist in isolation. They accumulate day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year to create a life that feels distracted and overwhelming. And the same is true if we really notice the, the quality of the information that we take in, where we uh, notice that the meaningful conversations we're having, like the, like the conversation we're having right now or, or had before we hit the, the record button on the show. Uh, and so, you know, I think the more productive and meaningful things we choose to focus on, the more productive and meaningful we feel our life is because we don't just, we, we regain control of, of our attention from the world around us. I agree. I limit my time with these gadgets because I feel that the yeah. quality of my life is diminished when I am in that 24 seven cycle, albeit news or on the phone yeah. or on the tablet. Um, talk a little bit about how working fewer hours can actually increase 
our productivity because it's it's counterintuitive, <laughs> yeah. right? It, it is, but it, it kind of has the same effect as a deadline, for example. So, so if you have an important uh, report to write, for example, instead of saying, okay, I'm going to spend the afternoon writing this report, say, I'm going to s- schedule a timer for 45 minutes in which to hyper-focus on just doing this one thing. So I'm going to choose what I pay attention to. I'm going to tame distractions and, and say no to the ones that come up or maybe capture them on a distractions list as I'm trying to focus you will find that in those 45 minutes, you accomplish more than you would in an entire afternoon's worth of distracted work. And this is the power of managing our attention well, I think, is when we don't take control of our attention, our our attention naturally gravitates to anything that's one of three things. So we naturally pay attention to anything that we find pleasurable. We naturally pay attention to anything that is threatening. And we naturally pay attention to anything that's new and novel. And so we even have a novelty bias embedded within our mind where it releases a hit of dopamine for every new and novel thing we we focus on. And so, like you said, this traps us into the cycle of focusing on what's latest and loudest and not really focusing on what's important. But, you know, if you think back to your last most productive day, you probably weren't tending to a bunch of distractions. You probably had a clear uh, sign of what was important. You probably were on a deadline. So that kind of narrowed uh, your focus in and and made your work a bit more threatening, which led you to focus on it. And you probably accomplished more in one hour of of that deep focus than you would maybe in some entire days. And, And so I think this is the jump that we need to make is that Time management doesn't matter as much anymore when we're surrounded with so many distractions. What matters more than anything else right now is how we manage our attention. You know, if you walk down a Barnes and Noble or you'll see hundreds of books devoted to time management, but most of them won't allow you to kind of reclaim this attention that you have, which is frankly more limited. It's more in demand. It's more necessary than it's ever been that we use this ingredient well. So I think by shrinking how long we give ourselves to do something, we can use it that much better to kind of simulate this deadline. I really like and agree with what you just shared. I work from lists. I have multiple lists. You know, I've yeah. got that sort of the core dump, my brain dump list where I get it all out. And then I've got the list within the list. And then I've got the days list. And I find that when I prioritize in this way, I am much more efficient because I do know that, that multitasking yeah. is a myth. It just does not happen. It just doesn't work. We can't actively focus on more than one thing at one time. I mean, you know, multitasking does work in some very limited situations. It works when we can do something without thought. <laughs> and so, you know, when the things are habitual, they only require active attention when we need to uh, focus on them and intervene. We can run while we breathe, <laughs> while we listen to to music and kind of half pay attention to the TV that's on in front of us at the gym that's showing these stupid cable news highlights that, that do compromise our happiness. And so I think, you know, with habits, we can, but like you said, with anything that's worth prioritizing that you decided to do ahead of time, really deeply focus on it. And, you know, that's easier said than done. That's why there's there's an entire book <laughs> that I wrote here that that will help us get to this state. But it's worth doing because, uh, again, you know, the state of our attention is what determines the state of our lives. Very well said. Let's talk about how to tame distraction, like a, a couple yes. of specific tools, because we all can theoretically agree. Yes, I need to tame the monkey mind. Well, well how, do you, right. how do you do that? Uh, I think you got to start with what your problem distractions are. You know, in the book, the, the biggest, the longest chapter, as I'm sure you saw, <laughs> was this idea of taming distractions because the idea of it is so nice. But the fact of the matter is what we see uh, as a distraction is just something that in the moment is more attractive to us to focus on than what we truly want to be accomplishing because it's more pleasurable, because it's more threatening, because it's more novel. But we can tame these things ahead of time to to great effect. One thing that I highly recommend people do is there's this amazing grayscale mode on our phones. And so if if you go into your phone's settings and you search for for grayscale, G-R-A-Y scale, it turns your phone's screen black and white. And so it's it's like you're reading a newspaper instead of really uh, engaging with social media and things like that. And it's a stupid hack. It doesn't really change the, the functionality of your phone unless maybe you're a graphic designer 
designer or something. But it, it changes how uh, pleasurable and threatening and novel uh, an object of attention your phone is. And I will make an argument that your time on your phone will be cut in half because it hooks into your attention less often. You know, this is something I highly recommend people do. Doing a phone swap. And so when my fiance and I were out for dinner or something, we happened to bring our phones instead of, you know, leaving them at home, uh, which we do about half the time. But sometimes, you you know, you get into a debate with somebody, you want some, something to look as, uh, something up on. So we swap phones. And so we each have something to take pictures with. We have something to, to capture ideas. We can text one another ideas that, that come up. But still, we don't have a personalized world of distraction available to us at all, all points in time. Um, email, maybe to, to give folks a third one, because everybody on the planet struggles with email, is to um, you know bring some awareness to email. Because I think you know it's like keeping a food lock, where you eat about a third less when you chart. Uh, everything that you eat over the course of the day, when you uh, simply keep a tally of how frequently you check for new email messages, um, you'll find that you check for new messages more often than you think you do. Uh, the average knowledge worker checks their email 88 times over the course of the day. And so really becoming aware of it, maybe only checking for messages if you have the time and the attention and the energy to deal with whatever might have come in to, to bring that deliberateness to email as well. Let's talk a little bit about the contagion of these digital devices. And, and I'll give a, a kind of a funny example. The other night I was out to dinner with my parents who are in their 70s. And I am very aware that when I'm with people, I'm going to put the phone away. I mean, I just don't yeah. don't take it out. I'm sitting there and my parents who are in their 70s are checking their emails. Oh, and I'm like, whoa. And, and I'm resisting the <laughs> urge, right? Because it's a contagion, right? One person takes it out and then the other person takes it out. And pretty soon everybody's checking their emails. It's like the yawn, right? When one person yeah. starts to yawn. And, oh, it, and it's kind of kooky. Yeah. You know, by the way, you know, when we flip our phone face down on the table, when we're with somebody that we love, we think we're being respectful of them, but we still have been shown to check it when it's face down on the table every three to five minutes. And, uh, you know, there, there was one study that they measured uh, coffee shop patrons. It's kind of a creepy study because you imagine like some guy just sitting there with a notepad observing people in the coffee shop and how often they check their phone. But, but when they interview people afterward that left the phone on the table, they found that those people felt less close to one another afterward. Uh, they felt less connected to one another afterwards. And here's kind of the sad part is they, they even related their relationship quality as being lower than those who, who dove deep into a conversation. And, and so I think tactics like doing the phone saw and we, you know, you probably talk about this a lot on the show. We underestimate how contagious our behavior is. You know, if we're checking our phone, it, it suddenly gives everybody permission to, to check their phone. So, you know, meetings where there's a phone basket there, uh, family dinners where we have a no phone policy. Uh, so, so tactics like these and simply modeling behavior, say if, if you're a leader of a team, you know, if you check your phone less often, your team will check their phone less often in meetings too. And so, I think that's a big part of it as well. And it's about training the brain, right? Like it's it, mm -hmm. in order to break that habit of being um, digitally distracted, you need to work at it. You need to practice at it and then replace it with something that is more interesting. And I think lowering how stimulated we are by default as well, because when we, you know, what one of the most alarming statistics I encountered over the course of uh, of writing this thing was that on average, we focus on one thing for only 40 seconds before we switch to doing something else. Yikes. So we pick, we, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then, you know, th this is measuring uh, employees at Microsoft and they found that when these employees, they, they were working in front of a computer and they had an app like Slack or, or instant messaging messaging open, they switched every 35 seconds. And so every half of a minute, and, and you know, if you think back again to that last most productive day that you were just thinking about, chances are you weren't flipping around between a bunch of different things every 35 to 40 seconds. And, and it just, you know, this goes to show this, this deeper problem that, that you were just touching on is we're so stimulated by default, you know, 
because our mind releases dopamine for every new and novel thing we focus on, it essentially rewards us for multitasking. And, and this makes us feel more productive than we actually are. It's, it's kind of like working on a sleep deficit. If we're working on a sleep deficit, we rate our productivity as being higher than it actually is. And I would wager uh, that a similar thing happens when we're busier. You know, it doesn't matter what we're busy about, but when we switch between things more often, there's more dopamine coursing through our brain. The, one of the main cl- pleasure chemicals. And, and so we feel more stimulated. We feel like we're getting more accomplished, even though productivity is not about how busy we are. It's not about how much we produce. It's about how much we accomplish over the course of the day. And, and so I think, you know, this really is something that we need to chip away at over time. You know, we're so stimulated by our environments by default, but uh, but but the most meaningful experiences that we have and, and the most productive days that we have, they don't come from this stimulation. They, they come from being less stimulated so we can reflect a bit more on our experiences so we can see the meaning behind conversations. You know, if you leave your phone at home when you go to a restaurant with somebody and they go to the washroom, you have no choice but to let your mind wander to to how meaningful the conversation is to yeah. to what you might want to chat about next to to something you forgot to talk about to some to some story you want to share instead of just looking at your phone uh during that time and so i, I think that's a big part of it too i'm so enjoying our conversation and so hyper focused that i've blown <laughs> past the break to learn more about chris bailey and his work and the book we're speaking about today hyper focus how to be more productive in a world of distraction please visit a life of productivity.com. And on Twitter, you can find Chris at Chris underscore Bailey. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back. Who says money can't buy happiness? Whether you are a skeptic or seeker, check out Lisa's new book. Are we happy yet? Eight keys to unlocking a joyful life. A boot camp manual for greater emotional fitness is available at Barnes and Noble, Amazon, IndieBound, and HarvestingHappiness.com. Here's a truth bomb. Emotions are contagious, and happiness is a universally desired state. But we tend to forget that we all have the freedom to be happy or the liberty to be miserable each day, regardless of external circumstances. Explore the journey of human happiness, how to find it and keep it, with Lisa's documentary film, H Factor. Where is your heart? Visit HarvestingHappiness.com to learn more. We're back exploring the power of productivity with my guest, Chris Bailey. This conversation originally aired in January of 2019. Let's get back to it. Let's talk about the five top activities that make us happiest. This is fascinating. Yeah, th- this is fascinating. Th- this comes from uh, a focus study or, or a mind wandering study uh, of all places. And they examined, they, they sampled about, you know, uh, tens of thousands of people. I think they got about 250,000 responses at, at the end of the, the survey. And they sampled people uh, and asked, asked them throughout the day periodically, what are you doing in this moment? Are you focused on it? And is your mind wandering? And how happy are you? How would you rate your subjective happiness? And they found fr- from all this data that the things that lead us to the greatest amount of focus are also the things that make us the happiest. You know, what a fun finding, by the way, as a tangent, you know, the more focused we are, the, the happier we are. But the top five things that lead us to focus, number five, listening to music, uh, number four, I was listening to, to some music before we got on here, some Ed Sheeran. It's very depressing, but I find sad music happy for some reason. Uh, number four is playing. <laughs> uh, number three is talking and investing in our relationships. Number two is exercising. And number one is making love. And and so, you know, the more of these things we do, maybe in conjunction with one another, you, you can make love. Well, making love is kind of exercise. It's a way of investing in your relationship. It's a way of playing. And you can listen to music at the same time, too. So if you do that all day, every day, you will be very happy. Yeah. And I think what's <laughs> so interesting about being so distracted in our lives, that the distraction leads to stress, that leads to fatigue, yeah. that leads to just needing to put oneself in time out 
at certain points in the day, which leads to the disconnection from the very people that we find the most joy from. And we're making less love, having less sex, feeling less good. And then looking for that release of dopamine and oxytocin and endorphin in strange places. Yeah, we get it from Instagram instead of the person that we're with. Yeah. And this is like... um, this is something that I think is is what makes our our attention so powerful. It's like no no fillet of salmon will, and uh, this comes to my mind because this is what I'm having for lunch today. Um, no fillet of salmon will be as delicious as the fillet of salmon you focus on with 100 percent of your attention. No no cup of coffee will be as delicious as the one you focus on 100 percent. No uh, conversation with a loved one will be as meaningful as the one you focus on 100%. And this is a cost of switching between things uh, so often and, and being so stimulated, looking looking for stimulation uh, from Instagram instead of from a conversation with a loved one is, is there's less depth to that. There's less focus to that when we're constantly bouncing between things. And by the way, you know, this cost of switching between things, this would honestly be fine if we were able to switch between things seamlessly. But there's this phenomenon called you know, to nerd out a little bit, but I feel like, uh, you know, it's an audience of smart people. There, there's this phenomenon called attention residue, where this this means that something uh, still exists within our attention from what we were just doing as we switched to doing something else. And so we're having this conversation right now, but a part of us might be recalling what we were doing right before we were having this conversation. And when we switch between things every 40 seconds, as an example, when we don't dive deep into the experience, is we don't really focus and become immersed in any one thing because a a part of us is always remembering what we were just doing, which prevents us from becoming immersed in what's in front of us. And so this is yet another cost of this constant, constant switching is we we listen to music less, we play less, we invest in our relationships less, we make love less, we exercise less. These are all things that, that take longer than 40 seconds to do. Yeah, this is the the cost of doing business in today's society. But the the good news is that uh, because we can teach old dogs and young dogs new tricks that we (laughs) we can train ourselves through practice. You know, the the repetition allows the brain to become reprogrammed, basically. Yeah. And this is, you know, it's something that we have to work at over time. But, you know, when you become less stimulated, you work more deeply, you experience life more deep, you enjoy food more. It's it's amazing. Like every part of your life increases the amount of control. The, the, the fascinating thing about uh, how much control we have over our attention, which which is, uh, you know, anti-correlated with how stimulated we are, is that the, the research around that is pretty conclusive. You know, the more control we have over our attention, the more we remember, the less guilt and doubt we experience, the less we feel overwhelmed, the stronger our sense of purpose is with what we're doing. And so there's such power in that idea. You know, many years ago, you don't know, but I'm going to tell you many years ago, I had a conversation with Dr. Ellen Langer at Harvard, and she's been studying mindfulness for probably I want to say 35 years. And she doesn't study it from a Buddhist perspective. She, she studies it from a very Western eyes perspective. And she said, here's the deal. We are either mindful. And when we are mindful, we are fully present. We are fully aware. We are conscious of what we're doing. We're conscious of what we're saying and our actions or mindless, which is the absence of those qualities. And when we're in that yeah. state of mindfulness or full presence, um, we find that uh, we have to say we're sorry less. We don't do things you know, that are wrong. We don't mess up as much because we are conscious and aware of our action. There was a productivity experiment I conducted many, many, many years ago during what became the Productivity Project, where I meditated for 35 hours over the course of a week. And you know, while, do it, while trying to focus outside, and it, you know, it, it was inspired by meditation retreats I've been on and stuff like that. But, but something that my fiance, now, now fiance, told me back then really kind of took me back. And uh, she said, you know what, Chris, like I've never felt more loved than I do right now with you doing this experiment. 
Mm. And it, it led me to, to the idea that, you know, what, what is love, but, but sharing, uh, quality attention with somebody as well as quality time. And, uh, I think it is about that idea of mindfulness. You know, the, the, if you look at the, the title of the book, hyper focus, it's so intense. It's so, you know, and the cover is very vivid and stuff like that. But, but I think it's really not as intense as it sounds. It's just about bringing uh, our, our deliberate attention to something. It's about, um, you know, taking back control of our attention. You know, the world so often decides what we focus on. So when we focus on things with deliberateness and with intentionality behind what we do, you know, that that's where we become more productive and, and experience more meaning in our life. And, you know, if there's one thing that, that doing such a deep dive into productivity has, has shown me from all the research, from all the experiments, from all the experts I've had the chance to chat with, it, it's that what lies at the core of what it means to be productive is not working faster, 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 more, more, more. Uh, it's doing the right things, first of all. And it's doing that with intention. You know, it's really this intentionality that not only make, is what makes us human, but what leads us to become more productive. Because when we have more time to do than more stuff to do than time to do it in, it's so critical that we turn off this autopilot mode, that yeah. we become mindful, not mindless, that we notice what we're focusing on so we can actually realign it to what's important. Let's go back for a second to the lovemaking metaphor, because I think this yeah. applies to other areas of our life outside of our intimate relationships. And that is that when, when we make love, we do so with presence. We're fully there. Mind, body, spirit, emotion, all the senses, everything is switched on. Yeah. If we apply that same practice to these other areas of our lives, how we show up in the world, how we approach and complete projects, how we engage with the world out there, we'll be happier. Yeah. Make love to your work. Make love to life. Make love to life. That's right. I mean, it sounds a little goofy. I mean, but, yeah. but you know, I can say that unabashedly because, you know, yeah. I'm middle-aged and I'm sassy, so I don't care what people think. That's right. <laughs> you know? Who gives a shit? Yeah. <laughs> Who gives up? Bleep. But, yeah. you know, but really, like, if, if we approach our life in this way, mm -hmm. I think that we will be happier and probably more productive. Yeah. You know, there, there's been a lot of research on flow. You know, this idea of uh, that me high chicks at me high yeah. coin, where it's like, uh, oh, yeah, I can. I know how to pronounce that. Um, it, it's funny because the the editor that that edited Hyperfocus is the same uh, editor that that edited his book. And uh, and so when we were pitching a, the book around to different editors and different publishers and things like that, you know, we went to Penguin Random House had headquarters and like meeting with these big shot editors. And I saw this book on his wall. It's like, oh, you have Mihai Chicks at Mihai's book. And he was like shocked that somebody knew how to pronounce the guy's name. So I think he might be responsible in part for what got me the, the, the book deal. But you know, if you look at the, that state of flow where we're so present in what we're doing so as to become immersed in it, it's like we become what we're doing. Yes. And time seems to flow by so fast. It's like we're not doing anything at all. The thing, the surefire way, the best way to enter into flow is to have sex, to do something stimulating in that regard. And, and this leads us into a state of flow without fail. If yeah. you want to become focused, it's very easy because it's pleasurable. It's very novel. There's there's hardly anything more pleasurable or novel than sex. And, and so, you know, I, I think when we, it's possible to bring that presence to other parts of our life, but we do need to become less stimulated by default in order to, to kind of make that room and, and get there. Yeah. I, and, and, you know, it's funny. Mihai, Chiksent Mihai, is uh, an early mentor of mine. And he encouraged oh, yeah. me when I was a, a graduate, a midlife graduate student, which was back in 2005, to pursue my work in positive psychology. So I have mm -hmm. huge regard for him and have learned a lot from him. And he's in a documentary film I made and he's been on the show. And Oh, amazing. He's he's all that. <laughs> I hope I look like him when I'm older. Like he has a very like, I, I think he's a very handsome man. I, I hope when my hair turns white, like when uh, the beard turns white too, that I, I look like me high chicks at me high. That, that'll be uh, that'll be a life well lived. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ring me out. That's what I want. You know, I want to be wrung out by life when I go like there's not yeah. a drop left. <laughs> 
you know, that's, yeah. that's what my plan is. We are out of time to learn more oh. about the fabulous Chris Bailey and his work. Please visit a life of productivity.com. On Twitter, you can connect at Chris underscore Bailey. And the book we've been talking about today is Hyper Focus, How to Be More Productive in a World of Distraction. And not to worry, Chris will come back. We're going to hang out some more. We have just not even really uh, gotten... Yeah, we haven't scratched the surface. We have not scratched the surface and, and we'll do more together. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, it's nice chilling with you today. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness today. This is Lisa cypress Cayman on behalf of my guests, Lisa Feldman Barrett and Chris Bailey, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day and remember to be kind to one another. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes via our free app or from our libraries at toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, and other fine podcast platforms. To learn more about Lisa's global consulting services, please visit harvestinghappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced in collaboration with Toginet Radio. KBUU Radio Malibu.net and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.